Welcome everyone to the talk on polymetric coupling using the precise open form adapter. So I'm a postdoctoral research associate at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab and I just wanted to introduce my research first before getting started with the uh, precise adapter changes. Uh, so my field of research is in nuclear fusion energy and why this is important is because it is one of the renewable sources of energy along with solar and wind power. Uh, and the focus here is on fusion, which is uh, almost three to four hour orders of magnitude uh, higher in energy gain than its counterpart fission, uh, but obviously much more challenging as we will be talking about. The fuels used are uh, the isotopes of hydrogen, uh, deuterium and tritium, which get converted to helium, and hence we do not have any radioactive species. Um, but as I was saying, the challenges involve uh, burning the plasma to make this reaction happen, which requires millions of Kelvin temperatures. Um, and just to give you an idea of how challenging it is, just earlier in February of this year, uh, the UK-based laboratory JET was able to produce 59 megajoules of energy over five seconds, which was a world record. So going towards uh, commercially producing energy using nuclear fusion is still a long way ahead of us. Uh, but research starts much earlier and we have to look at how to maintain the components at uh, reasonable uh, temperature limits uh, before, uh, which can withstand those high temperatures. I think it can withstand millions of Kelvin, but you have to shield them in a proper engineering manner, which is where Tokamax come in and they'll be talking about. Uh, what is also required is modeling and simulation of these full reactors so that before we create uh, a, a working power plant, we know what we're going into with modeling and simulation. So that is where the project that I'm working comes in, which is called uh, acronym FERMI, uh, Fusion Energy Reactor Models Integrator, uh, which is looking at a whole device modeling of fusion reactor focusing on the blankets. Um, so the different physics involved are plasma physics and neutronics, so the plasma, which will interface with the thermal hydraulics of the structural components and the coolant, which is usually a molten salt. Uh, there are obviously a lot of magnetohydrodynamic effects because magnets are used to confine the plasma so that they don't touch the uh, actual physical walls. And of course, the structural mechanics of the, uh, of the entire reactor. So this is kind of an uh, outlay of how Fermi is supposed to look like from a modeling perspective. Um, and there are a number of um, things going on over here. Uh, plasma physics going into precise and this bottom right uh, kind of square. Is where, is where we are focusing on for our work, uh, which is looking at the coupling of this flow solution using open foam, magnetohydrodynamics using a high mag coming from a, a company out of uh, California. Uh, then the neutronics will be done using different solvers such as Advantage Shift and MCMP. The structural mechanics will be done using a software called Diablo, which is developed by Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and they are all our partners in this project. And Precise is expected to kind of come into the role of uh, kind of data transfers and couplings uh, wherever two-way coupling is involved. For one-way coupling, we'll probably be looking at file-based transfers. So <clears throat> to give an idea of what uh, is the actual system we're working with, uh, we're partnering with a company called Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which comes out of uh, MIT. And they have a concept fusion reactor, which is called ARC. <clears throat> which looks somewhat like this, and there's a small man over there to give you an idea of the scale um, with some details over here. And the reference paper is below, and that's the best place to look up if you need additional information on this. The right-hand side shows an actual CAD uh, design of this geometry, which we'll, we are working with. Mm, so, and uh, the triangulated mesh is for neutronics, and for uh, open foam simulations or the thermal hydraulics, we have to need, need a different mesh. What's shown over here is the plasma in the middle and surrounding is the liquid blanket, as you can see, and the walls is the vacuum vessel. Uh, although it's very th shows up very thin over here, there are a number of different layers of the vacuum vessel, which I'll be talking showing also later on. So my focus is on coupling the neutronics and the thermal hydraulics. So the neutronics is performed by another group here at Oak Ridge, and they give us the heat deposition. So basically the amount of heat that is deposited because of the reactions that goes on in the plasma, and that is used as a source term in the, uh, for the fluid flow. And that is what I'm modeling here with uh, open foam and a coarse grid, grid shown over here with some fine grid uh, simulation results shown over here. And I'll not go into details about this, but there's a recent publication which you can uh, look up if it's, if it's that's of interest. 
but we can uh, get ideas of the velocity fields where we have temperature hotspots using these type of simulations. And this is just using open foam simulations for the flow of the molten salt um, in the uh, through the fusion blanket. <clears throat> what we are next interested in is doing couple simulations. Uh, and for the couple simulations, what I mean is the fl the fluid blanket the blankets that you saw over there have uh, different liner walls uh, of solids. So we have fluid structure interaction, conjugate heat transfer, and also coupled uh, electrohydrodynamics effects going on between, uh, so current flow between this fluid as well as the solid. Over here, the simulation only shows uh, fluid flow, heat transfer, and, and uh, heat transfer to the fluid as well as the solid. You see at the bottom right of here, this shows the different layers. So first there is this first wall, which is shown in, shown in cyan. Then you have a structural inconel layer. Then you have a small uh, fly is the molten salt over here. Uh, so that's a liquid. Uh, and then we have another beryllium layer, which is solid. Uh, and it has implications for the tritium breeding. Um, next, we have another inconel structural layer. And then is the big blanket that I was showing simulations for before. And we need to simulate all of these together. And this is all done currently in open form. Uh, coupled with uh, one-way coupled with neutronics just through file-based transfers to get the heat deposition so that we can do the fluid flow and the heat transfer. But as we want to go into more 3D coupled simulations, that's where Precise comes into the picture, where we want to have volumetrically coupled um, for, for the heat transfer as well as the uh, electrohydrodynamics between the fluid and the solid. So to start off with uh, getting my hands into Precise, I first installed the precise uh, libraries from SPAC um, and then started with the tutorial modules, uh, OpenFoam DL2 and OpenFoam Calculix, fluid structure interaction problems. And, uh, and this is just to get into uh, the precise world, so to speak. <clears throat> so uh, once that was done, the, uh, as an extension of the project, another thing that was uh, completed was the coupling of Precise with Diablo, which is the structural solver. And this was done by the folks at uh, folks who are our uh, collaborators at our Lawrence Livermore. Um, and OpenFoam Diablo was validated against the OpenFoam Deal 2 for the same uh, fluid structure interaction problem. And this will come in handy later on. So uh, getting into the meat of things, and starting with the volumetric coupling in the open foam adapter, I just wanted to give a kind of layout for how the open foam adapter looks like as it is, um, which was uh, developed, of course, by uh, the precise developers, and I'm sure they'll be talking about it more. Um, so the major changes were in the interface uh, interface modules. So in the interface modules, that's where you specify what are the uh, kind of locations in open foam where you would want to uh, transfer the data. So the existing uh, OpenFoam adapter has phase centers and phase nodes because it only does surface coupling. Uh, and this was simply extended to volume and what, what I call vault surf. So the volume uh, are essentially cell centers. So the same uh, concept as phase centers extended for the boundary field to the internal field. And the vault surf are the faces or the surfaces of the cell volumes. So this is essentially where the fluxes are being calculated, such as the phi variable in OpenFoam. Uh, and I just implemented this so that we have kind of the full capability. Um, besides that, the other changes were to obviously to be done in the module section. Uh, the OpenFoam adapter already has a CHD and FSI module. Um, so I added a volumetric module where we want to have velocity, temperature, alpha T's, turbulent thermal diffusivity. This I required for my particular uh, tutorial problem that I've set up kind of all by myself, which I'll be talking about in detail, uh, and flux for that phi. And this flux is the only one which uses the vault surf. All the other three uses the volume locations. So uh, the test case. So uh, this is something I spent a lot of time on to figure out what kind of test case to use so that we can test the volumetric coupling in OpenFoam. So uh, as a starting point, I thought I would use the flow over a heated plate tutorial, which is already there in Precise, but remove the solid part. So in this case, if you remember this, uh, the section that is shown as plate, that is actually a solid part, and the temperature is specified, uh, the wall temperature of 310 Kelvin is specified at the bottom of the plate. But I remove that and just use uh, this uh, interface patch of the plate uh, to specify the wall temperature of 310 Kelvin. So this essentially reduces to a simple channel flow with heat transfer problem. Mm, and this can obviously be solved in OpenFoam directly using uh, something like a buoyant pimple foam solver, which is a monolithic solver which solves uh, the Navier-Stokes equations in conjunction with the heat transfer equations. 
<clears throat> but in order to use a volumetric coupling, uh, so the coupling strategy that I invoke is through operator splitting, and this I'll again talk about in detail, how I split the buoyant pimple foam into two solvers, essentially into a hydrodynamic solver and a thermodynamic solver, uh, and then make them communicate through precise over the entire volumetric region. And then that is used to kind of compare with the monolithic solver that is already existing in open foam to do kind of validation work, to see what kind of speed ups or slowdowns we're getting with the overhead of the communication and what kind of accuracy loss we're getting because of these uh, data exchanges between the two solvers. So now there'll be three great cases that I'll be talking about from the same setup and this will become apparent along the way how these cases have been structured. So the case one is a simple laminar flow with one-way coupling. So um, density is specified as constant so essentially there's no feedback from the energy equation into back into the flow equations or the Navier Stokes equations. And buoyant pimple foam simply does it by solving the uh, velocity equation, the energy equation, and then the pressure equation. And then this is split up now into what I call a flow solve uh, and an energy solve. So the flow solve solves the uh, velocity and pressure equations uh, and then passes the velocity field follow the entire volumetric velocity field over to energy solve, where it calculates the fluxes from that field and then does the energy solve. So with that energy solve, we can get the temperature and also the temperature can be obtained from that buoyant pimple foam monolithic solver, which is shown up here, uh, and then we can compare them to see what kind of accuracies you're getting. And this is just to kind of show um, uh, the representation of the of the precise config file and how that looks like and in this case just to kind of test it out what I did was um, passed the velocity as well as the flux so this is uh, the extra capability of that vol surf locations and this you can use if you want to if you don't want to recalculate the um, the fluxes from the velocity field in the energy solve or in the thermodynamic solver uh, but instead just pass it as a variable um, using precise as a communicator. Um, so this is a simple one-way coupling, hence there is no feedback from the flows bit from back from the energy solve into the flow solve. Uh, so this is just for visualization purposes. Uh, next, for the verification of the one-way coupling, if you see on the left panels, these um, so they show the no coupling, and on the right two panels shows the one-way coupling uh, results using precise. And you can see that the velocity magnitude and the temperature fields, they almost are indistinguishable uh, when you look at it in this manner. But I've obviously developed more tools which will do a kind of uh, get an R squared norms to do a cell by cell uh, kind of matching or cell by cell evaluation between the no coupling and the one way coupling results. And I'll come to that. So the second case is a laminar flow with two way coupling. In order to do two-way coupling, what I did was uh, model the density, similar to how we model density for kind of incompressible flows using a Boussinesque approximation. So what happens is the density becomes a function of temperature. So after we do the flow solve and pass the velocity to the energy solve, um, the energy solve calculates the energy equation, um, solves, sorry, solves for the energy equation, and the density is calculated as a function of temperature. Um, and then that density will now affect the flow field as well. So density is being passed back uh, from the energy solve to the flow solve uh, to do the fully two-way coupled simulations. Um, and then <coughs> and the structuring of this is shown over here as I just explained. So uh, velocity goes from flow solve to energy solve and the energy solve uh, returns the density back to the flow solve to do a two-way coupling per time step. And again, just a good idea to kind of visualize, to see that we are doing everything that we intended to do so that uh, we have reasonable kind of solutions. And, and of course, now, we, uh, now what we're plotting over here is the uh, differences of the one-way coupling strategies and the two-way coupling strategies. So what do I mean by that? So uh, over here, we are plotting the velocity magnitude, but that is the velocity magnitude calculated from the one-way coupling on, on the left, as, and the so the one-way coupling minus no coupling divided by no coupling so we calculate the norms of the errors per cell from the one-way coupling and the no coupling and on the right hand side from the two-way coupling and the no coupling and remember here that the no coupling cases of these two are different because there are two different physical problems but we see that the errors on the left are much lower 
the order of 10 to the power minus 5 for the velocity field, 10 to the power minus 2 for the temperature. But on the right, the two-way coupling, the velocity field errors uh, reach almost uh, kind of 0.6% uh, of the errors. So these are the percentages. And <clears throat> so th these errors uh, are obviously expected more for the two-way coupling problem, which is set up in a manner similar to the, uh, the setup of the uh, tutorial problem. <coughs> The time taken, uh, this is again also compared to the no coupling strategies. And for the one-way coupling, we get a slowdown of about 5%, but for two-way coupling, it's about 35%. Now, the last case is a turbulent flow case in comparison to a laminar case of both uh, case one and case two. So here what we did is increase the velocity field, increase the grid resolution so that we have a more complex uh, closer to real complex flow situations. <clears throat> so the same equations are being solved, uh, but in addition we have a, a turbulence model, which is being solved at the end of the pressure equation in each time step. <clears throat> and that turbulence model evaluates the, uh, dam the viscos turbulent viscosity as well as turbulent thermal diffusivity. So this additional term, the turbulent thermal diffusivity, now has to be passed from the flow solve to the energy solve when we do the two-way coupling. Uh, because that is required to solve the energy equation. So this is an additional term that needs to be put into the precise modules in the OpenFOAM Precise Adapter and um, is an additional variable which is passed from flow solve to uh, energy solve. So just a side note that uh, I put all of these cases into a kind of a tutorial module for volumetric coupling with the solvers, uh, the flow solver and the energy solve, uh, which you can also play around with if you want, the three cases, case one, two, three, um, and then the no coupling results. And the utilities contain something called the calculate error norms, which you can use to calculate the differences between the fields from each of the cases and the no coupling results. Uh, so of course this has to be worked on much more to make to be made it uh, to be made rigid, so that something can this can be useful for uh, everyone in this workshop and beyond hopefully. <clears throat> so next part of the talk is kind of focusing on the scalability of the volumetric coupling and how we can improve the results that we get just out of the box uh, from the implementation of um, of the uh, volumetric coupling in the open film adapter of Precise. So here we're showing the cases two on the left and case three on the right. Uh, the red line for each case shows no coupling um, and the blue line, broken blue line shows the results of the two-way coupling, which is the turbulent two-way coupling case. And all results and forth uh, are mainly from the case three. <coughs> Sorry, the, on the right-hand side is case three and on the left-hand side is the case two. Uh, and the, for each of them, the simulation time is normalized by the serial simulation time of the no coupling case. Which, are, uh, which is mentioned over here on the left, it's 0.2 seconds per time step. On the right, it's 5.3 seconds per time step because it's a larger grid, essentially, as you can see, and it has the turbulence model in it. But what is interesting to see is that uh, the time difference, the scaling is pretty well, even on larger processors, uh, but the time difference, which is around 35%, if you remember, for this case two, uh, goes up tremendously. It's almost close to uh, 25 times uh, for the case three with the turbulent flow case because there is more number of inner iterations that need to be done and more kind of uh, data exchanges. Uh, the time stepping is uh, smaller um, and all of these contribute to uh, the fact that the computational time required with for the two-way two, two -way couple case is much larger. And also the accuracy you'll see is quite less for the temperature field, the R-square values uh, for the case two um, is of the order of almost 10 to the minus five. <coughs> and for the, uh, for the case three, it's 10 to the power minus three. And for the velocity fields, it's even worse uh, for case three. So some of the strategies that I kind of tested out uh, on different uh, items which are there in the precise config file is to kind of turn off the accelerated coupling, first of all. And that seems to uh, work in this case that the acceleration of the coupling, uh, when you remove that, uh, that kind of speeds up the time, uh, the communication time, and this is probably because you make the solvers less coupled, or uh, because the, as you will realize soon, the physics of the problem is not very tightly coupled. <clears throat> uh, the recommendation in the precise documentation of using coupling tolerances of two orders of magnitude higher than the solid tolerances, 
uh, improved the uh, accuracy that you were seeing uh, before. Uh, and one sensitive feature that I found was this coupling window, and uh, we'll go into more discussion about the coupling window soon. Um, but it was found that at least two coupling iterations were required per time step to converge. And remember that this current scenario is relatively loosely coupled because the temperature difference between the incoming fluid and the, uh, and the plate is not too large, and the sensitivity uh, is governed of this, uh, or not the sensitivity, but the kind of the response time between the temperature field and the velocity field is governed by the thermal expansion coefficient, which is the coefficient which governs boost and density. Uh, that is what was also chosen to be quite a small value. With those changes, uh, as you can see uh, on the blue line again showing the two-way coupling results, uh, that shows around about four times of a slowdown as compared to the no coupling time. Uh, and previously it was around 25 times. So these with these strategies that I just talked about, uh, we were able to reduce the computational time. Uh, but the scaling kind of uh, got affected a little bit, as you can see from as we go from four to eight processors, the number of the computational time increases. The black line shows the ratio of the computational time between the two-way two, two, two coupling and the no coupling uh, for the corresponding number of processors. And the broken lines show the same computational time on two nodes. <coughs> so essentially, uh, a simulation over here uh, with a solid, uh, solid line shows 24 processors on one node, uh, whereas for the broken line, that's 12 processors each on two nodes. And we see that there is some interprocessor communication which slows down the computational time a little bit. And these are kind of some uh, challenges that we want to address. <coughs> okay, uh, before kind of uh, going forward, uh, the next thing that uh, I looked at was the effect of the coupling window. Um, and I'll explain this graph a little bit because this was kind of insightful uh, to some extent to investigate uh, the volumetric coupling that we have performed over here. So first of all, on the x-axis is the uh, coupling the coupling window normalized by the time step. So essentially, a number of uh, 10 to the power 2, which is 100, means that the coupling window is 100 times larger than the computational time step. And the computational time step is the same for the flow solver and the energy solver. This means that after 100 iterations of the flow solver and the energy solvers, uh, it'll evaluate the tolerances uh, between the exchange quantities, which in this case is velocity and uh, uh, density, and <clears throat> if the tolerances are within acceptable limits, it will go on to the next coupling window, or it will go back. To, if it's not, uh, if it's beyond the, the tolerances are too large, then it goes back to the start of the coupling window and redoes, redoes that uh, coupling window. <clears throat> so the broken blue line with the circles, the, this shows the number, the average number of computational time steps, uh, which is performed. Uh, for the two-way coupling, normalized by the number of computational time steps that is done for the no coupling case. So essentially, if you, you see that it stabilizes to a value of two, which essentially means that every coupling window has to be done twice in order to reach uh, convergence for this particular problem with this particular setup. <clears throat> the blue line with the squares shows the total time uh, total computational time taken by this two-way coupling approach uh, normalized by the no coupling approach. So you can see that it starts off very large with, for very small coupling windows. Uh, so that means because it has to do too many iterations between, um, too many kind of calculations in between uh, themselves. And <clears throat> so it goes from 50 times, and but soon after about uh, 10 or 20, uh, the computational time reaches about three to four times that of the, uh, as compared to that of the no coupling or the monolithic solver. <clears throat> so the, since this so shows the total time, the squares, and the number of iterations performed is shown by the circles, the difference between these two shows the time taken by precise in the, in, in the communication between, uh, during the volumetric coupling approach. And uh, my initial expectation was that this computational time would decrease, kind of at least um, at least linear, even if not linearly, but at least it should keep decreasing rather than showing this uh, kind of up and down behavior as we increase the coupling window. Because when we increase the coupling window, uh, that means that the number, the 
data communications are being lowered. Uh, but what is interesting to note is that the accuracy is not being affected. And here I just show the uh, accuracy of the uh, z-velocity field, which was the least uh, accurate in the predictions. The if you see at the top, the UX and the UI and the temperature fields, the, there are the accuracies. And these accuracies are again, again calculated using that calc error norms uh, kind of um, a module, uh, which compares these two-way coupling results with the no coupling results. <clears throat> so yeah, this is useful information, but uh, this, again, these non kind of monotonic behavior as we increase the no normalized coupling window uh, kind of pointed me to the direction that this uh, problem itself is not to uh, not a very tightly coupled problem and which we are trying to solve in a very tightly coupled manner. <coughs> Hence, uh, we can do some kind of strategies for our way forward uh, to accelerate the coupling. Uh, may not be useful for loosely, uh, loosely coupled volumetric data exchange as we saw before. Um, the coupling window is a very important parameter which should be tested out for volumetric coupling approaches. Um, and <clears throat> what we're going to investigate next, as I was talking about, is the uh, is a more tightly coupled problem where we have a larger temperature differences, and where the uh, thermal coefficient value is also this in this case is 2.5 times larger. But that is a realistic value for the fluid that we are using, so we really don't need to go beyond that. But uh, it would definitely be an interesting kind of problem to see how that affects the results and the coupling strategies and the coupling approaches. So that's kind of the, towards the end of the talk that we have gotten so far. As I said, um, this is work that I've been mainly doing over the far past year, and but there is a lot of interest in uh, getting this kind of work done for the next couple of years at least, um, and because we are continuing to look at more uh, kind of more tightly coupled problems, and uh, this is just heat transfer and Currently, I'm working on developing, uh, sorry, implementing uh, MHD models into OpenFOAM. And once we have that, the coupling will become even tighter. So what we kind of need to do is also to make the operator splitting approach more robust. Because if you remember, we exchange the data uh, after the flow solve is being performed. So the velocity uh, kind of predictor and corrector uh, operations are done, and then we pass the velocities. But in open form, what they do is they calculate the energy equation based on the uh, predicted uh, u velocity before correcting the u velocity. <clears throat> so we want to. Do, so that's what I'm working on right now to see how those approaches change kind of this volumetric coupling setup, uh, and also investigating other coupling parameters. Um, looking forward to getting some new ideas of um, the, the time stepping approaches if anything new is being implemented. Um, and so yeah, so and once all of these issues are resolved, uh, which I'm hoping will be done soon, then we can couple OpenFOAM with Diablo for the magnetohydrodynamics uh, and the heat transfer. So that's all.